camp on Snow's Island. Two pages later, he talks about special, special places. And then he talks about the camp being across from Snow's Island. So he, he contradicts himself. And I've been back to the original source, his original draft, and it still says the same thing. <laughs> anyway, we did find the camp right here. And uh, we did some archaeology, found a nice cannonball, three pounder with a nice British um, broad arrow on it, a wonderful silver plated, uh, actually the whole sterling stuff, complete silver eye button, probably from one of Marion's officers. Uh, with the stirrup, <coughs> we got another stirrup from um, Luther. <laughs> and of course, the canvas did. Uh, we did a lot of work there on the lots of lead shot. We've got the uh, nice feature that shows that Marion was not living on sweet potatoes, but was enjoying fine hogs and beef and deer and uh, oysters. Uh, he uh, enjoyed a few oysters. Uh, and we have this nice feature, which we think that might possibly be a palisade. Uh, this looks just like a palisade we've seen from other places. The palisade being a uh, Fortress kind of place, so there may be a fortified position there. Uh, and then there's this redoubt. George, or excuse me, Robert Bass talks about the redoubt and how he used to take the kids there. And I'd seen that for years since, like, when I first started going on Snow Island. So we found that pretty quickly. But I always looked at that, and it didn't look like a redoubt to me. It looked like maybe some sort of agricultural place. And it's in a crazy place. Because here, this is the PD River. Yeah, it's the PD River. And it's, and there's Stone's Bluff. And it's back behind the bluff. What's it pretend? Try to talk about that in a minute. The important thing is that I knew that Charles Baxley, if I was here to work, he was going to something they say to me, did you look at the redoubt? And I'd have to say, no, Charles, I forgot to do that. So I didn't want that to happen. So I said one day to Sean Taylor and I, we said, let's go and look and see if, there's, if we can do anything about the redoubt, quote unquote. And so we spent a day and we hogged a uh, profile right through that baby. And there is a nice organic level right here showing where the original ground surface was. There's no doubt there's shovel marks right there showing dirt was purposely thrown up here. We found a bullet bowled in the metal middle of it. It's the redoubt that Robert Bass is talking about. It's Marion's redoubt that was built. You know, and for, and there's a, you can debate whether or not it's actually the Port Ferry redoubt. Some people are going to claim that that's not true, but it's, it's confusing. Now, going back to the tactical part of this, what I'm thinking of is Trey Hyman knows that if you go up the, up the road and come down this little road here, this is there's a bluff line that goes along the P.D. River right here. And that was the original road that went from Ports Ferry downhill. When you get down to here, you go right through here. The high ground goes right here where the camp was. And then you can cross over here to get the more high ground to go to Pot Potato Bed Ferry or Britain's Ferry, or whatever you want to go into down into uh, Britain's uh, Neck. But if you wanted to go to Snow's Island, you could go right here and cross right here at Dunn's Bluff. Furthermore, there's a little creek right here. There's a pattern. Colonial forts, where, when they say they're on the Congaree River, aren't on the Congaree River. When they say they're on the PD, they aren't really on the PD, of course, because of flooding. They're set back away from the river. And there's usually a little creek that people would know about, if you're on the good side, that you would take with your canoes and go up that little creek, and there were the fort. Well, here's the camp. There's a little creek right there. There's the camp. There's the road. There's access to Snow's Island. If you put a redoubt right there, you can control access to Snow's Island, access to the camp. It makes tactical sense. All right, so we move on. By the way, I've got a nice car in 14 days, which fits really well with what we wanted. Goddard's Plantation. A post-revolutionary war, mostly, there's some colonial material there. Post-early uh, uh, plantation, <coughs> posting ground construction, which runs out before the war. In fact, it kind of runs out. This te technique of digging a post and setting posts in it is something that goes during the middle to uh, 
late 18th century construction technique. In the posts, especially these two posts here, here, of these two structures, were large chunks of creamware, which date to the Revolutionary period, and before, and they were, they had been in a fire. And they were so hot that the, that the slip had melted. And they weren't there because they had been thrown away. They had been purposely put into the post hole in order to hold the post steady, a filler. So it was something they reused after they rebuilt these things. This is right a place where old Weems came up and burned out plantations. It's speculative, possible, but in any case, perhaps the reason that fire melted that stuff so hot was because it was in a house that was been burned down purposely. All right, Black Mingo. Charles Baxter nailed Black Mingo before I even got there. But we were able to go there and find it and find uh, archaeological materials uh, there, including the, the, the buckshot, your British uh, frogs, your British uh, pipes for your, uh, your muskets, uh, showing that the British were camped there, right there at the, at the, at the ferry crossing. Blue Savannah, we found a little bit of material there. I'm not convinced this is it. We did find a nice cluster of rifle balls and buckshot. Ports Ferry, um, we found uh, British Sea Service musket parts, uh, probably things from the pre-war that the, that the militiamen would have used. Uh, so we have archaeological evidence there. Um, and these are all different little places that we had, uh, again, showing in the um, strategic areas. And this actually was there to show the road that goes right down through here. It looks like it reached out on the slide. So let's, let's get to some conclusions here. So what did I, like, what did we learn, if, if we learned anything about Francis Marion that made this different? And what I think we've learned is that there was a symbiotic relationship between Francis Marion and the people who lived there. Marion provided authority. He linked this little Whig community to the larger Whig resistance, giving them the authority. That's why they called him there. They said, we need a continental officer, someone who has the authority to act upon our behalf for us. And that was Francis Marion. He provided security with his men for the community. This one was very good because he was partisan. He wasn't able to stand up against the British head to head, but making those raids. Salt, salt was critical. Salt was something that we'd gotten from uh, the Bahamas. We didn't make it ourselves until the revolution came along and then suddenly that supply got cut off. So we had to go and start making it on the coast on our own. He was able to round that up and distribute it. He didn't distribute it to the laurels.